Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, a quick announcement before we get started. Uh, RSA Conference is upon us very, very soon, February 24th through the 28th. You can, if you register before January 24th, which is pretty soon, you save $900 on a conference pass. You can save an extra $150 by going to securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2020. Make sure you check it out. They've got lots of really cool things going on at the conference this year to foster communication, uh, learning and villages and technical stuff too. So uh, I would like to introduce our guest for this segment, Robert Siciliano. He is from Protect Now LLC. He's a certified speaking professional um, and has appeared on many popular TV shows uh, talking about cybersecurity um, and is here today to talk about security awareness. Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Uh, it's interesting, Robert. Uh, security awareness is something we talk about quite frequently here on the Security Weekly Network. I was particularly interested in the way that you phrased it with security appreciation training. Tell us more about yeah. that. Well, the, the, the problem with security awareness training that, that uh, we've seen over the years is that consumers, uh, employees, they don't care. And um, that is because security kind of against uh, our core beliefs as humans. You know, when you think about it, trust is uh, inherent within us. You know, we are an interdependent species. We depend on each other for our survival uh, in community, for, the, for that matter. And so we are required by default to trust one another. And therefore, security is just not something that... Uh, you know, we are um, at our core, we, we want to believe or we want to deal with because we have to trust that when you're driving down the road, that what what separates you from the oncoming vehicle is painted double yellow stripes in the ground. You just have to trust that the person coming at you doesn't want to die that day. And so when it comes to security awareness training, it's mostly revolving around what to do and what not to do. And the element of this is why you should care isn't involved, and this is why you should appreciate security isn't involved in most the awareness training. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, Robert. I also think that uh, when you were saying that, it made me think of something I hadn't considered before is that when we distrust immediately, like in a situation, like when we tell people to, like, don't trust that email, we feel bad as humans, right? Because if trust is built into our, our fabric because of necessity, what we're asking users to do is distrust. And I think they kind of feel like a jerk when they do it, right? Yeah. And, and they're not quite sure how to process all of the distrust. Again, mm -hmm. it's just not normal. Uh, you know, the bad guys know that human beings just aren't accustomed to this. And what they do is, is, is they go along with the process of truth all day, every day. They socially engineer. They will convince uh, their mark that everything is okay up until the very end where they twist things just a little bit. And that twisting of the truth, there's enough good information there, enough proof for the victim in this case uh, to click that link, to respond with sensitive information, to agree that everything is to be trusted. And the problem with that is, of course, that you know most people just aren't um, you know, capable of seeing the difference between good and bad when their blood pressure is up, when there's some immediacy revolved in the transaction, when the majority of the information looks good to them. Therefore, you know, they go for it. And that right there, you know, that is what makes the bad guy successful. But what we do, what I do, what I suggest people do is they look at the much bigger picture. Uh, and to look at security as a benefit to your personal growth, uh, to the success of your business, to the security of your family in a much different light than what's currently being provided. 
Yeah, I oftentimes don't believe that the users understand the impact, right? Is that a, a component of their appreciation is allowing them to understand the impact of what could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. You know, it, and like you have to think of it like this, too. In our culture, you know, I'm, I'm 51 years old and uh, growing up, you know, it was always believed that, you know, these things can't happen to us, that they only happen to other people. You know, uh, when uh, a house gets burglarized or there's a home invasion or there's a murder and the local news go goes and they send a reporter out and they interview the neighbors, the first thing the neighbors say is, you know, you just didn't think it was going to happen around here. And, and I've always, you know, been of the belief, like, why wouldn't you think it was going to happen around here? Why didn't you think that your neighbor would have that? You know, what, what makes your neighborhood so much safer than the rest? Like, we have all these inherent social norms that are myths that we are accustomed to that further isolate, you know, uh, the, the type of awareness training that is prov provided today it doesn't dispel any of those um, myths or, or misbeliefs. And yeah. I think that's a huge problem. Well, it's a great analogy too, because you know now with the internet, it's not just your neighbors, like every neighbor and attacker is just a few milliseconds away on the internet. I think it was Dan Gear or someone that said that many, many years ago. Um, and you know, to put that in the physical world, we may know our neighbors and we trust you know, the environment and we know someone may have to work hard to come into our neighborhood to do something bad on the internet it doesn't take much for someone to contact us to do something bad, right? We're all connected now. Yeah, and so when um, when, when we as a, a uh, uh, you know, as, as like getting back to as, as a homeowner, you know, if, if we're not doing like the basics, the fundamentals, like locking our doors, like I know that I lock my doors and I have a home security system. I have like 20 plus security cameras. I got a, you know, Belgian Malinois who's 60 pounds that will, <laughs> you know, they call them furry death missiles. You know, I've, I, I am, I am, uh, uh, you know, on guard, but I'm not paranoid. You know, I have all these various systems in place to reduce my risk. And when people hear about the level of security that I've incorporated into my personal life, they think that I'm paranoid. And paranoia, as we know, is mental illness. Now, I have not been diagnosed with any form of mental illness ever. Uh, you know, some people might think I'm a little crazy, sure. But, you know, I'm not mentally ill in, a, in, in this paranoid i have perspective and the complete opposite of uh of me of paranoia it you know it is well, the complete opposite of, of paranoia is really being secure and being in control and the, the issue here is that we have these this misbelief that if you are thinking securely then you must be paranoid mm -hmm. and that's the big part of the problem here and consumers aren't going to do anything. Employees aren't going to do anything until they fundamentally understand how security impacts them as individuals and impacts their family. And when they understand the basics and the fundamentals, they're in a much better position to be able to, to protect the data in which they are entrusted with on a professional level. Are so, they, Robert, go ahead. Oh, Matt. sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say. So, what are some of those appreciation things that we have to teach? the consumer and the employee. What I mean, how do we do that, right? Because I think that's the crux of how do you better craft a, a security appreciation program? Sure. So beginning with like, if we're speaking to like basic security or cyber security or cyber hygiene or digital literacy 101 in regards to InfoSec, right? You know, a, a credit freeze, like a credit freeze, of course, you know, you all, you should know what a credit freeze is. You both should have a credit freeze, which is like fundamental to protecting your identity from new account fraud. And that's one of those things that's been around. This has been around since February of 2008. I've had my credit frozen since February of 2008. And um, not having that, that fundamental thing is like not you know, drinking water or eating food or sleeping. Like that's such a fundamental thing to one's personal security as it pertains to protecting your identity. And so when you explain what this is and how easy it is to get and how everybody should have it and that it's free, if people begin to go, oh, it's that easy to protect my identity? Sure. And so you're, you're providing them the absolute one-on-one -on -one basic fundamentals. And then beyond that, you know, you explain – the simple stuff like not reusing a password across multiple sites and show them examples of what this means and, and how it's so easy for a bad guy to take your existing credentials that are already out there on the web and simply download them and log into your, your existing sites with those known credentials that have been stolen thousands of times 
with 25 billion records being compromised. You know, like that is like getting so grassroots and so fundamental, but it begins to make people sit up in their seat and go, oh, that's really all it is. Like it's as simple as that to protect my identity and to passwords and utilize a password manager that can create uppercase, lowercase numbers and characters, you know, 12, 14 characters long. Like it's that easy. And, you know, and you and I get all this stuff, but the majority of the public, the majority of employees don't. You know, they're just, it, you start, you know, going at them with phishing emails. And this is what it looks like. And these are all the various ways they try, they try to con and scam you. And these are all the characteristics you look for. That is so far beyond most of the, the basic comprehension of your employees, beyond the fundamentals of, of, of to appreciate the basic tools that are at your fingertips. And that those are just a few examples. And I could talk to you about a seatbelt. You know, think about a seatbelt. A seatbelt's been around since the 50s. Seatbelts have been required by law to be installed in vehicles sold in the United States since 1968. So since around my birth, seatbelts have been required. But for most of us, for most of the audience, you know, if you're in your 40s and 50s, you didn't have seatbelts on as a kid. You probably weren't even in a car seat, right? And, and you, you're older than the actual seatbelt, many of you. And to top it off, many of you were either carried in the front seat by your parents or um, you, you yourself were carried in the front seat, you know, or you carried your baby. So like, and a seatbelt is something that we wouldn't think not to wear today because of regulation, because, because laws have required it to be installed, and because laws have required right, that states will fine uh, people who don't have a seatbelt and so on. And so it, it is becoming to the consciousness of us as a society that you have to wear a seatbelt or you will either be fined or you're just irresponsible. In so many ways, we frowned upon not wearing that seatbelt. It's taken us 50 years to get to that point. And we're only, what, 20, 25 years into the internet as we know it today for consumer use, right? And you World know what, Wide Web. And you know what's interesting, Robert, is one thing that didn't work with seatbelts that I'm sure there's a security analogy to and I don't know if it was in the 80s or so where they had the cars that the seatbelt used to come over automatically, right? It was like attached to the car and used to come, and people hated that. I mean, yeah. I think that kind of factors into when you force security on people without explaining the value, right? They tend to reject it. Well, they, so they, they looked at it and they obviously at that time figured out that that's probably not the best design. People will just turn the car on and let it move behind them and they right. would just go thinking like, you know, and then now they have the beeping which you can't avoid the beeping and it annoys the heck out of you until you put the belt on, you know? So, 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 so like, you know, the, the, the evolution of the seatbelt in, in our culture and our society is to a point where when I ask an audience, how many of you wear your seatbelt? Every single person in the room raises their hand. When I ask the question, you know, how many of you use a password manager? Maybe three or four. When I ask you, how many of you have a credit freeze? Maybe three or four. Like they, we just haven't got there regarding the appreciation of security like we've got there regarding their appreciation of a seatbelt. It's taken, uh, you know, some juggling to get to that point. It's taken five decades to get there. But once you start to put it all into perspective and in how, you know, you're not paranoid for putting your seatbelt on, you're smart. You're taking responsibility, not just for your safety, but, but, but for everybody around you. So it gives you full control over that vehicle should something go wrong. And, and, and people start to perk up and like, oh, that, that's beginning to make sense to me. Maybe safety and security are things that I should, you know, be interested in, you know. And, and like just like we talked about home invasions and burglaries, most homes have a security system installed after the house is burglarized afterwards. You know, like why wait until after your house is burglarized to put a home security system in when two million homes are burglarized every single year? That's 20 million homes in the next decade. You know, it's just a matter of time. You know, my homes have broken into twice or previous homes were, you know, so like it is an, an, an in inevitability that you're going to get hacked. They get a car accident. Their identity is going to get stolen. And so, you know, people need a, a very rounded, open, honest Q&A type of discussion was fully interactive regarding what security is, what security isn't, security awareness versus security appreciation before they begin to grasp the concept of the actual life benefits of what security is and does for you, opposed to 
it can't happen to me. These things only happen to other people. Why would they choose me? Right, you know, right. and all the stupid stuff mm. that people, you don't, they, they literally are in denial. They're, they're physically, functionally, emotionally in denial that these things are, are going to happen to the not going to, or are going to happen to them. And that needs to be changed way before you provide security awareness in regards to like fishing simulation or anything else for that matter. It, it so sounds Robert, like Robert, there's oh, a closer relationship between personal uh, online safety and security yeah. and the security of the business, right? And it is very much a, a, a correlation there that relating it to something yes. personal will also improve the security right. of business. I guess I live in a so, utopian world. I like to think that when employees come to work, they will work to protect the, the business nope. in the in the PII, but you have to relate that to something personal to get them to change habits across so Paul, the Paul, you're right. Yeah, you're right on my track of thinking for a second. I think mm. we do a little disservice when we talk about security, not in a safety context. You just hit on it a little right. bit, Robert, right? If we can associate why certain security principles are good from a safety perspective, safety of my identity, safety of my family, safety of my home, we might connect a little better with the, the general audience, the consumer, because they probably understand the safety concerns, benefits, et cetera, versus what we consider to call security. Exactly. And, you know, the concept of security, of course, has been around just as long as safety has been around. But safety is definitely more personal to who we are and what we do. And yes, we interchange the words safety and security all the time. Like safety, of course, is hard hats and steel toe boots and looking both ways when you cross the street. It's ladder safety. It's eye protection. We know that. You and I know that. Security, of course, is protecting from thieves and predators, from violence and theft and so forth. But we use those words interchangeably in our culture. You know, I don't, and you probably maybe do, you know, but I'm specific as to what those words mean, at least when I'm speaking to my audiences. You know, in, in conversation, I might weave them in here and there. But all that being said, that that connection has to be made with the audience so that they understand what these things mean. Because safety is life safety, generally. Security also can be life safety. When you think about it, violence, right? Life safety. And so well, life security. So that, that said, you know, that connection is not, not, not being made uh, via all the formal security, none of the formal security awareness training that I've seen put out in the last decade, other than what I'm doing. I just don't see it. Uh, so, Robert, you have some resources out there, speaking of that, uh, for folks. Uh, and I'm assuming some of these are, are freely available. There's a couple of uh, safer.me and creditparent.org. Sure. So I really appreciate that. I provide security awareness training. That's what I do. I have been, um, you know, pounding the pavement uh, on the ground at conferences. I did, uh, you know, Black Hat a couple of years ago with HP. I, I am you know, the boots on the ground security awareness training that is at all the various conferences, breakout sessions, keynotes, full day workshops. I do continuing education training for a variety of different industries. And the follow up to that, of course, is the phishing simulation training that involves micro learning. Micro learning, of course, is little bits of information you might get daily, weekly, monthly, throughout the year to respond to a phishing email inappropriately. It's followed up with bits of information. So next time you click that link, this is what you need to be aware of and so forth. E-learning, so online, you know, eight to 10 hours of e-learning training regarding, uh, of course, information security, all the things to look out for, scam awareness, all the various, um, uh, uh, things to be aware of regarding identity theft protection and prevention, social media security training, online reputation management, and of course, personal security, violence prevention, because, you know, you have to know how to protect your physical being first and foremost. And once you understand all the fundamentals that revolve around all these different things that thieves and predators utilize to get access to us, you begin to be able to look at when you get a phishing simulation email, you look at it a, a much differently with a much keener sense as to what to be aware of going forward. And then when the pop-up regarding updating your operating system or updating your software shows up, you're not just avoiding it and shutting it down because it bothers you. You have a much more of a, an attentive focus to it on what it means to the security, not, of your, not only of your device, but also of your organization. I, I I like that. It's what it makes me think is that uh, we as uh, hackers and security professionals, right, we see and have executed the attacks 
Therefore, we have a very heightened awareness of safety and awareness online, right? And what I think we've tried to do in the past that hasn't worked is we try and make others understand how those attacks work. But what I, th I hear you saying the main theme is we just need to make them understand how to be safe. And I think our awareness training in the past has been making them aware of the bad things. We need to just teach them how to be safe. Yeah, uh, you know, like, like the way I look at security awareness is it's head-based. It's up here. It's intellectually. You understand what to do and what not to do. I look at security appreciation as, as heart-based. Heart-based, like if, I, if, if you do something for me, if you, you know, whatever, I, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I send you a thank you, you know, that I'm doing that out of love and appreciation. Like I, it's a feeling, you know, when I appreciate someone or something, that there's, if there's more to it. You know, that there's a bond there. It's on a cellular level. Uh, it's heart-based. So security awareness is, is head-based. Security appreciation is heart-based. And that's getting in, that, 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 that's connecting with people in a very different way than what security awareness does. Fantastic. Great analogy. Um, yeah. Great and there analogy. are uh, resources in the show notes. Uh, Robert, I know you, you have to run, but I want to thank you for appearing on the show today. Anytime, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time and attention. I love what you're doing here. Thank you very much. With that, we will conclude the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time on Enterprise Security Weekly.